Okay, so I'm going to be talking about vanishing viscosity and conserved quantities for 2D incompressible flow. And I would like to start by thanking the organizers for uh, inviting me to give this talk here for this opportunity. And also I'd like to, to congratulate Uriel on his 80th birthday. Happy birthday. Okay, so let me start by acknowledging my collaborators. Uh, Alexei Sheskinov from uh, University of Illinois, Chicago. Milton Lopez Filho from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Ana Mazzucato from Penn State University. Christian Seiss from University of Munster. Roman Schwedkoy from Chicago also. Emil Wiedmann from Ulm. So these are not collaborators all on the single piece of work, but they will, they're will they they're collaborators on the different pieces of work that I'll be talking about today. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with the observation that anomalous dissipation is a cornerstone of turbulence theory. And turbulence means we need to consider irregular flows. Uh, in 1949, Anzager proposed the following conjecture, well-known conjecture, that anomalous dissipation may occur in, in an inviscid flow with less than a third regularity, and inviscid flows with more than a third regularity conserve energy. So this led to uh, a lot of research, okay, a whole body of work um, on, on these two uh, sides of the conjecture. And regarding the, uh, the first part, uh, anomalous dissipation also uh, uh, known now as wild solutions. The first wild solutions, or the first solutions with anomalous dissipation, were constructed by Sheffer back in 93, and uh, then uh, later reconstructed by Sherman, a different construction by Sherman in 1995. And these were, were flows at L2 in time, L2 in space, so they were not in the natural physical space. And then in 2009, there was a breakthrough with the work of Camilo and Laszlo, who proved uh, anomalous dissipation in L infinity, L infinity uh, in L2, and that even more L infinity into L infinity. Okay, <clears throat> moving forward quite a bit, uh, this, this burned a, a whole uh, flurry of activity. And then uh, in uh, 2013, uh, Phil Isaac in his thesis, and then a different uh, uh, a proof given by uh, Tristan Laszlo, Cam Tristan Camilo, Phil, and Laszlo in 2015 proved the existence of uh, one fifth, holder one fifth, uh, essentially holder one fifth um, flows with anomalous dissipation. That was followed by the work of uh, uh, Tristan, C C Camilo, and Laszlo in 2016, uh, where they had the correct holder regularity in space, LC uh, one third, and L1 in time. And I want to point out that these are all 3D constructions. In 2013, Antoine Chiffreau uh, proved the existence of a C one tenth um, <coughs> wild solution uh, uh, with anomalous dissipation. And this is a construction that actually does work in two dimensions. Finally, in uh, 2018, uh, Phil Isaac, uh, uh, concluded uh, the, uh, the, the this end of, of uh, the Anzara conjecture, established the Anzara conjecture by producing uh, solutions in C one third uh, minus epsilon, which with compact support in time. And then uh, <clears throat> Buckmaster, Delelis, Lukihidi, and Vickel in 2019 uh, did, redid the construction with a prescribed energy profile. Okay. Most recently, uh, Tristan and Vlad pro provided the uh, viscous solutions with prescribed energy profile, therefore, and with, a, the, with an inviscid limit with anomalous dissipation. Okay. So I want to point out that their viscous flows are not Leray Hopf, and in particular, they do not satisfy the energy inequality. Buckmaster and Vickel's construction is eminently 3D, it does not work in two dimensions. On the other side of the Anzagar conjecture, the situation is a little bit more uh, fluid, more simple. Uh, the regularity threshold for conservation of energy was first established by uh, Uriel and uh, Sulem 
Christian Salem in 1975, L infinity in time and H56 in space, followed by a uh, work by Greg Ink in 94, where he, he proved exist, he proved the regularity in the conservation of energy if the flows are a little bit better than L3 in time C13 plus epsilon in space. And then Constantini and Tidi sort of put the uh, final period in the matter <clears throat> with L3 in time, uh, B one third plus epsilon three infinity in space. The state of the art actually be uh, belongs to Sheskinov, Constantin, Friedlander, and Schwedkoy in a paper of 2008, where they proved conservation of energy for flows who are L3 in time, B one third three C zero. So C zero means the Littlewood Paley components vanish at infinity as the uh, frequency goes to, to zero. These, are, these work in both 3D and 2D. <clears throat> in uh, 2000, there was a paper by Duchamp and Robert with a 2D result stating that if the initial vorticity is, uh, this should be LP, it should be initial velocity in W1P or initial vorticity in LP for P larger than three halves, then you have conservation of energy. So there's a typo here. Okay. <clears throat> um, including the limit case P equals three halves is something that follows from the work of Sheskinov, Constantin, Friedlander, and Schwid. And I want to comment more on this uh, in, in a second. So <clears throat> this involves studying optimal conditions for the energy flux to vanish. Okay, so let's now concentrate on two-dimensional flows. So 2D Euler on the torus periodic with, with L2 initial data and no forcing is given by this system that we all know and love. DTU plus U grad U is minus gradient of pressure, divergence of U is zero, and the initial condition U T equals zero is U naught. We're interested in weak solutions for which the vorticity is P is power integral. It's LP for some P greater than one. Note, <clears throat> For 2D flows, what's special is that smooth vorticity is transported by the uh, flow field U, and therefore LP bounds are preserved by the evolution. So it's a very reasonable problem to study 2D order with LP initial vorticity. Wild solutions, in contrast, have no control on integrability, uh, integrability of vorticity, and there is no vorticity transport. They're far too irregular for this. <clears throat> Okay, so let me start with a definition of a weak solution. So uh, for some uh, finite horizon T and some initial data uh, U naught in L2 with the vorticity in LP, I will say that U is a weak solution <coughs> of the Euler equations if <coughs> the, um, <coughs> the integral identity <laughs> below holds, which simply means testing the, uh, the PD against a test vector field, which is divergence free. In addition, for almost every time, the U is divergence free in the sense of distributions. Okay, so existence of such weak solutions is known. Uh, this follows from the Pernamida 87 in the case P greater than one. And then it follows from the work of Delore and, and also of Vecchi and Wu in the case P equals one. Uniqueness only holds in the case P equals infinity. Okay, I will call a weak solution conservative if its L2 norm is constant in time. It's preserved. Okay, theorem. So let's start with the following baseline theorem. Okay, suppose I have a weak solution with a vorticity which is L3 halves, exactly the critical uh, P. Okay, then U is conservative. I mentioned that this was a consequence already of, uh, of uh, uh, Sheskinov, Konstantin, Friedlander, and uh, Schwedkoy, and but we are actually going to give an elementary proof here. Okay. Moreover, the local energy balance law holds. Okay, so it's not only that it's conservative, but the local energy balance holds. Okay, so this result is con contained in that paper because L infinity W13 halves, which is what where U belongs, once you know that vorticity is in L3 halves, this space is actually a subset of L3 uh, B133 C0. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, let me give you an elementary proof of this result. 
So we just take emollifier. It's sort of the standard proof. You can evolve with Euler. Um, and then you get uh, the, uh, the evolu this evolution here where R epsilon is the radial stress tensor, the error, the commutator. Okay, you multiply by U epsilon and uh, rewrite all the derivatives that happen here and you get this, this equation here. And so what I need to do is to show that, that uh, my uh, left-hand side converges to dt of u squared plus div of, u, of uh, u u squared over two plus p, and the right-hand side converges to zero, okay? So that's part A, the, the, the temporal term. Part B is uh, the divergence term, and part C is uh, the, the uh, uh, error term, the Reynolds stress. A and B are subcritical for uh, uh, L3 halves, okay? In fact, what they require is only that omega belong to L6 fifths, okay? <coughs> <laughs> On the other hand, uh, it's the convergence of the energy flux term or the rate of stress that requires, um, that requires uh, uh, the three halves, the critical P, okay? And this is always a key point in all of the results along these lines. Okay, so let's look at the convergence of the flux term. It's pretty simple. We show that this converge, that the Reynolds stress converges to zero in L6 fifths, and that's enough because U is bounded in L6, L6. That comes from the Sobolev embedding. Okay, so we have in L6 fifths, we simply estimate this directly using nothing but uh, Holder's inequality. Okay, so <clears throat> we add and subtract u epsilon grad u, and then we measure each of these quantities in L6 fifths, and it turns out that everything works perfectly. This is exactly the holder exponents that we need. Okay. All right, now, <clears throat> p equals three halves is optimal in this argument. Okay, to see that, okay, so we notice that conservation of energy uh, hinges upon a scaling argument that has very little to do with dynamics. And what we're going to do, therefore, to show that this exponent is optimal is to construct a vector field which just fails to be W1 3 halves. In other words, uh, its vorticity is not going to be L3 halves. It's just, it's going to be LP for every P less than 3 halves. And the energy flux does not vanish. This is a construction based on the Littlewood-Paley decomposition. So we introduce a Littlewood-Paley tr truncation, SQ. Here it is. And um, we note that it's just a convolution with a mollifier and therefore it's smooth. So it's easy to argue that the energy flux for SQ vanishes if F belongs to W1 three halves. In other words, SQ dotted with SQ dot grad SQ. Okay, if F belongs to W1 three halves, F, sorry. Okay, so this is an easy adaptation of the argument with vorticity L three halves. It's basically the same argument. Okay, now if you test the Euler equations with this object, SQ of SQ of U, then it's easy to see that the proof of energy conservation reduces to showing that this flux here actually vanishes on average in time as Q goes to infinity. Okay, so <clears throat> this holds in fact pointwise in time for any divergence free field with curl and L3 halves. Theorem. There exists a divergence free vector field, <coughs> sorry, which is B1 third three infinity and is W1P for any P strictly less than three halves, such that the limb soup of, uh, of uh, pi Q of U is non vanishing. Okay. So I'm not going to show you how to prove this result. This is a construction. Um, it's based on a construction that was done, a three dimensional construction that was done in the paper by uh, Sheskinov, Konstantin, Friedlander, and Schwedkoy. But it, it, it's a non-dynamical example show, showing that P equals three halves is optimal as far as that particular argument that I showed in the previous uh, theorem goes. Okay, so but that's what I'm just noting here. The divergence free vector field U is, a, is not a dynamical example. It's not a solution of Euler. So uh, now our main question, is there a weak Euler solution? 
in two dimensions with some kind of control on integrability of vorticity and which is not conservative. Okay, so in other words, is there a wild solution with control on vorticity? Um, in particular, uh, is vorticity transported for this solution? Is there a Lagrangian structure? Can we talk about a Lagrangian solution? Kreishnin's 2D turbulence theory uh, states that there is a forward energy cascade, an entropy cascade, sorry, in 2D turbulence. And this implies that there's some kind of expected regularizing effect in two dimensions. And so it suggests that there may exist a dynamical mechanism which prevents anomalous dissipation in two dimensions, even for super, supercritical flows. Okay, so let me talk about vanishing viscosity solutions. I will introduce the following de uh, definition. U is a physically realizable weak solution of the incompressible 2D order equations with initial vo velocity, initial flow in L2, if U is a weak solution and there exists a family of solutions of incompressible 2D, 2D Navier-Stokes with viscosity nu, such that as viscosity vanishes, this, uh, this, uh, these uh, Navier-Stokes solutions converge weakly to U, to the limit flow U, and the initial data for the visco viscous solutions converge to U0 strongly in L2. So <clears throat> a, a, given a 2D Euler solution, if it's a limit of vanishing viscosity, I will call it a physically realizable weak solution. <clears throat> okay, what are the consequences of being a physically realizable weak solution? As far as energy goes, we have the following result. This is an old result published in 2016 with uh, Roman, uh, uh, Roman uh, Schmidtkoy, Alexei Sheskinov, Milton Lopsfilio, and myself. Uh, if you have a, uh, a physically realizable weak solution, of the incompressible 2D Euler equations, which is continuous in time until two, and its initial flow has an initial vorticity in LP for some P greater than one, then it's conservative. All physically realizable solutions are conservative if the initial vorticity is in LP, P larger than one. Okay, um, of course, P between one and three halves is on Zagar supercritical which means that in the Onzager scaling, it's akin to having less than a third regularity. Let me give you the proof. The proof is very simple, so I can actually do it here. Suppose, first, first of all, uh, it's enough to consider initial vorticities which are in LP for P less than two, because if P is greater than two, greater or equal to two, there's nothing to prove, it's, it's, uh, it's trivial. All right, so I'm going to assume that e, e omega naught is LP for some P smaller than two, and it's, that it's not an L2. In other words, it's L2 norm is infinite. Okay, from the fact that U is physically realizable, I know that there's a family of, of never stoke solutions, of viscous solutions, uh, with the, the uh, corresponding conditions. <clears throat> um, Omega, and I will write omega nu to be the curl of u nu, the two-dimensional curl. The vorticity equation, the viscous vorticity equation is then given by dt omega nu plus u nu grad omega nu is nu Laplacian of omega nu. And I don't have any boundary conditions because I'm on the torus, so everything is fine. If I multiply by omega and integrate on the torus, I get the dissipation rate for enstrophy. DDT L2 squared of, of omega nu is minus two nu grad omega nu L2 squared. From Gallardo and Ehrenberg, I can estimate for P between one and two, the L2 norm by the gradient of omega nu L2 to the one minus P over two times the LP norm of omega nu to the P over two. What I'm going to try to do here is to estimate, uh, so I know that omega nu L2 uh, as time time goes to zero, I know that this blows up. And I also know that it's going to expect it to blow up as nu goes to zero. The question is, how does it blow up? Okay, so then 
I get the estimate of, for my, the right-hand side of my entropy dissipation uh, equation, minus two nu of the gradient of, of omega nu L2 squared is bounded by this object on the right-hand side, minus two nu omega nu L2 to the four over two minus P times omega nu LP to the minus two P over two minus P. And two minus P is a positive number. So these are all negative exponents. This is a negative exponent here. I don't know if you can see my, my cursor here, my mouse, but um, <clears throat> minus two P over two minus P is gonna be a negative exponent. So now I'm gonna multiply the vorticity equation by essentially omega nu to the P minus one and integrate and get the maximum principle for the LP norm of vorticity. The LP norm decays as T, as T uh, moves forward. Okay, therefore I can estimate the L2 norm squared of the vorticity by the L2 norm of vorticity minus two nu L2 norm of vorticity to a positive power times omega is not to negative power. <clears throat> okay, so if I write y of t is uh, omega nu L2 squared, then integrating in time, uh, I get this estimate here. Okay, y of t, so L2 norm squared to this negative power is bounded by this. Okay, so I'm taking, I'm integrating from a certain delta on because I know that at delta equals zero, this blows up. Okay, in the limit as delta goes to zero, however, since this blows up, we have that the L2 norm squared is bounded by this object. Okay, so here's a rate at which the L2 norm of the vorticity uh, blows up. Okay, so I, I call attention to the fact that this is a negative power, two minus P over P. So as, as T goes to zero, this is indeed going to infinity. Okay. Now let's look at the energy identity for 2D never Stokes. <clears throat> the L2 norm squared of, of, uh, of U nu is, is minus two nu times the gradient of U nu squared in L2. And I can rewrite this in terms of vorticity uh, as the minus two nu times the entropy. I integrate in time and I use the estimate for, for vorticity and I get this. U nu at time T L2 squared minus U naught, that's a negative quantity, but it's bounded from below by minus two nu times the integral of this object, okay, this estimate here. What's good about this is that even though this is a negative exponent, this is integrable and it's integrable. And as nu vanishes, okay, now all of these uh, exponents are, this exponent is now, oops, it's now positive and uh, <clears throat> this exponent here is, uh, let's see, this is still a negative exponent, yes, but I have an extra new here, okay? So the, when I put together the extra exponent for new, the extra new, I get now a positive exponent for new, and as, as viscosity vanishes, this right-hand side now goes to zero. So I have that the L2 norm of U nu squared converges to the L2 norm of U naught squared. On the other hand, I still, this still, I'm still not done because I need to know that the L2 norm squared of U nu converges to the L2 norm of the Euler solution. Okay. Now, this is a consequence of the de Pernamida 1987 result, which is that for P greater than one, uh, the, the, you have strong convergence in L2 of the velocities, of the Dever-Stokes velocities. Okay, this is a non-concentration result. So using the strong convergence of the initial data, together with the known fact that there are no energy concentrations in the vanish viscosity limit in LP, P larger than one, we complete the proof. Okay, so this is a compactness result. I'm passing to some sequences as needed, of course. Okay, and so there, there are two main ingredients in this proof. One, to show that the uh, L2 norm, that, that the energy for U nu converges minus the energy, the initial energy goes to zero as viscosity vanishes, and two, that the energy for the viscous energy converges to the Euler energy. Elena? Okay, okay. so that was, that was a, a physical, physically realizable weak solutions and energy. 
Now I want to talk about LP norms of vorticity. Okay, so let's consider other conserved quantities, uh, namely uh, the uh, LP norms of vorticity. Since vorticity is transported by a divergence-free vector field, uh, we know that the smooth solution for smooth solutions, the uh, LP norms, and uh, act, in fact, any rearrangement invariant norms will be conserved at the smooth level. Okay, and so it's a natural question to ask regularity conditions for the conservation of this, regularity conditions on U, so that this, this uh, uh, remains true. Okay, more generally, uh, what are regularity conditions for U for omega to be a renormalized solution of the transport equation? And let me remind you what's a renormalized solution. So if I look at a linear transport equation, <clears throat> um, I say that a measurable function is a renormalized solution if the, uh, basically the chain rule holds. So you can compose with any C1 bounded function beta and the, uh, uh, the composition satisfies the same linear PD. One important consequence of being renormalized is that if B is divergence free, then all rearrangement norms of W are conserved. Okay, for instance, LP norms. That's because the distribution functions for W will be preserved. Also, uh, even more importantly, there's uniqueness for the linear transport equation, the uniqueness of renormalized solutions. There's a Lagrangian formulation of transport. So there's a notion of Lagrangian solution. These are all things that are desirable for our 2D flow. Okay, um, in an old paper with Anna Matsukato, um, and Noto Lopes Filho from 2005, we observed that if P is greater than or equal to two, then every weak solution of 2D Euler, uh, irrespective of, of how it was obtained uh, with a vorticity, which is an LP, is a renormalized solution, okay? And this actually is a straightforward co uh, consequence of consistency uh, from, uh, straight from the de Pernelion paper. In 2015, Gianluca uh, Scripa and Stefano Spirito proved that every physically realizable weak solution of Euler with vorticity in LP for P larger than one is renormalized. Okay. In particular, uh, LP norms are conserved, obviously. Okay. So here it was very important that they be physically realizable in, in their work. Their proof was done by considering the adjoint problem. So they do existence for the adjoint uniqueness of the renormalized solution. And it's similar to what uh, de Pernelion called their duality proofs, duality work. Okay. In 2018, Gianluca, uh, Camilla Nobili, Christian Seiss, and Stefano Spirito uh, went ahead and extended this result to P equals one. So every physically realizable weak solution with vorticity in L1 is renormalized. And their proof involves extent, an extension of the Pernelion theory that allows for L1 vorticity plus establishing uniform integrability because in both 2015 and 2018, they work on the fluid domain, which is the full plate, not on the torus. Okay, so there are issues of uh, <clears throat> tightness at infinity and you need uniform integrability to make sure that you're converging to an L1 solution and not to a measure. Okay, in summary, if U is a physically realizable weak solution, a vanish of viscosity limit, uh, with a vorticity which is L infinity LP, then if P is greater than one, energy is conserved. If P is greater than or equal to one, the LP norm of the, the uh, vorticity is conserved. If P is greater than one, the, you have uh, uh, no concentrations, you have a strong convergence, uh, uniform in time into L2 of the velocities. And if P is greater than or equal to one, you have a weak convergence of omega nu to the, uh, of, of the vorticity, viscous vorticities to the Euler vorticity. Okay. Question, can the convergence of vorticity be improved? Can it be upgraded or is it only weak convergence? This question was first addressed by Konstantin uh, Drivas and, and uh, Elgini in uh, 2019 in the case P equals infinity. So they show that if you have an L infinity initial vorticity on the torus uh, <clears throat> and you have viscous, this, this is not that important, the, the uh, viscous initial data converges to this uh, uh, limit in L2 
and you have forcing, which up until now has been ignored, okay, then omega nu converges to the Euler solution strongly, uniformly in time into LP for any P, for any P less than infinity. So this holds for Yudovich solutions. Okay. Their proof is, is quite complicated. It uses borderline regularity for the Biosavar law, plus some new, new uniform short time estimates on vorticity gradients. And they treat an intermediate linear problem. Recently, uh, together with Christian Seiss and Emil Wiedemann, we gave a much shorter proof and extended this result to initial vorticities in LP on the torus for any P. So we take in, uh, initial vorticities for the viscous problem, converging to uh, the initial vorticity for the inviscid problem in LP. We take forcing, which is L1 in time into LP, and then passing to subsequences as needed, we show that the viscous vorticities converge to the Euler vorticity strongly in L infinity in time, LP. Okay, nearly simultaneously, uh, the, the, in Italian group, so Gennaro Ciampa, Gianluca Cripa, and Stefano Spiritu uh, proved virtually the same result, but for p greater than or equal to one. Okay, uh, so I'm going to comment uh, on their on their result in uh, in a few slides. Okay, I'm going to make a lot of comments. Okay, um, they also take no forcing, zero forcing. So in what follows, I'm going to discuss the simpler case of no forcing and uh, our result. Okay, so this is the result. So if you have uh, omega naught and LP, P is between one and infinity, omega naught con new converging to omega naught strongly in LP, a physically realizable weak solution, then, <clears throat> um, then the uh, viscous vorticities converge strongly, uniformly in time into LP. Okay. Okay. Step one. So I'm going to give you the proof because the proof is our proof is actually extremely simple. First, the, the uh, viscous vorticities converge weakly to the uh, inviscid vorticity. This is uh, basically immediate. Okay, it's, uh, it's straight from the estimates. There's almost nothing to prove here, and the PDE tells you that omega nu is equicontinuous from time into the distributions. Step two. Uh, an application of the Aubin Lyon lemma gives you upgrades the, the uh, weak star convergence of L infinity into LP to continuous in time into weak LP. Okay. Step three the norms, the LP norms converge. The LP norm, this is the important step. So the LP norm of, of the viscous vorticity converges to the LP norm of the inviscid vorticity uniformly in time. So let me show you how do you do this. First of all, uh, LP norms are weakly lower semi-continuous. So the LP norm of the Euler vorticity is, is less than or equal to the limit in nu of the LP norms of the viscous vorticity, which of course is less than or equal to the limb soup. And then because of <coughs> the uh, uh, maximum principle, the parabolic maximum principle, I know that the LP norms of omega nu are, are bounded by the, the, L, the initial LP norms. And I know that those converge to the LP norm of the Euler initial vorticity. And because uh, of conservation of LP norms, this is the same as the LP norm of omega time t, of the inviscid norm uh, of inviscid vorticity at time t. Therefore, all of these inequalities are actually equalities and you get pointwise convergence in time. Furthermore, I can estimate the difference between omega LP at time t minus omega nu at time t from the viscous maximum principle. This is bounded by omega nu at, at some future time, capital T, with a minus sign here. And because the LP norm is conserved for the inviscid vorticity, this is equal to uh, the LP norm of, of the inviscid vorticity at time capital T. And I've just shown that this goes to zero. Therefore, the convergence is uniform in time. Step four, <clears throat> omega nu, uh, nu n at time t converges to omega time t uh, strongly in LP, pointwise in time. 
Indeed, in LP, there's an, a functional analysis result which says that weak convergence plus convergence of norms is, implies strong convergence. And here's where we need very strongly P is greater than one. Okay. Step five, convergence is uniform in time. Here, we use equicontinuity plus a repeat of the weak lower sum and continuity argument together with the uh, maximum principle and conservation of LP norm argument. Okay, so it's a very simple proof. Okay, we don't need any linear, uh, intermediate linear problem. Uh, if, without forcing, it's a very simple proof. It's somewhat more complicated if you do have forcing. Okay, and then you need to use an intermediate linear problem. But still, it's a very simple proof. Okay, finally, I want to make some comments on uh, the, uh, the work of uh, Siampa Kripa and Spiritu. First of all, they have no forcing, which complicates matters. Second of all, they give two proofs of their main results. One, a Lagrangian and an Eulerian proof. The Lagrangian proof is done on the torus, and in the Lagrangian proof, they only take p greater than one. They, the Eulerian proof is on the full plane, and that's where they manage to get p greater than or equal to one. P equal, they claim that p equal one works on the torus also, but they don't show uh, the proof. They just state that it works. They say that it's a lot of, uh, a, 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 a lot of technical harmonic analysis is needed. <clears throat> the Lagrangian proof is quite complicated. It uses a stochastic Lagrangian representat representation of the viscous vorticity because basically it's a com it, on the other hand, it's quantitative and they, they do it through a quantitative comparison of the distance between the viscous and the inviscid trajectories. For if P is equal to infinity, <clears throat> this is a bonus in their work, they actually do manage to get a rate for the uh, continuous in time LQ convergence, uh, but it depends, it's sort of, an, it's not an explicit rate because it depends on an L1 modulus of continuity of the initial vorticity. The Eulerian case does include P equals one, but the fluid domain is a full plane. The proof uses an intermediate linear problem, uniform integrability of omega nu, and an extension of de Pertilil. So it's quite complicated also. Okay. Uh, and a bonus of their work is that they extend our energy conservation result with uh, Roman, Alexei, and Milton to a uh, full plane. Okay, so they, they need to use a Serfati uh, formula for that. Okay, basically uh, it's the same proof. Uh, the only thing that they do is, is to, to extend the uh, compactness, which we know is C of zero T L2 loc, they extend it to C of zero T L2 for initial vorticities, which are average zero, integral zero. Okay. Here are some conclusions. The Anzagar scaling is not the last word on inviscid dissipation. Uh, there might be a dynamical mechanism to avoid anomalous dissipation, uh, especially in 2D. Okay, uh, it's, I, I, I tentatively or cautiously quote, say yes in 2D, but uh, actually what we proved was that there's a dynamical mechanism assuming that the vorticity is at LP. There, it remains to, to, to ask ourselves whether we can find uh, one third regular or, or less <coughs> flows uh, with uh, no anomalous dissipation. In other words, does 2D turbulence exist? Okay, vorticity transport is a relevant physical restriction on incompressible flow, which is ignored by wild solutions because they're too irregular for vorticity transport. Can we improve uh, energy conservation? Can we take it all the way to P equals one? Uh, and we have no tools because we don't have compactness. Uh, vorticity weak solutions, which are obtained as limits of smooth approximations or the vortex bob method are also renormalized. So, uh, so LP norms of vorticity are conserved not only for physically realizable weak solutions, but also for those weak solutions that are limits of smooth approximations this is something that was observed in, in the paper with uh, Anna Mazzucato and Milton Lopes Filho. And in the case of the vortex, and it falls from uh, uh, de Pernalillo stability estimates. And in the case of the vortex blob method, this is a new paper by uh, Gian Gianna Ciampa, Gianluca Cripa, and Stefano Spiritu. Okay, thank you. I'll stop here. Okay, thank you, Elena. Um, are there some questions? So you can ask your question uh, in the chat or directly by a note. Okay, 
And I, I have a question uh, about uh, the rate uh, of convergence of the Navier-Stokes uh, solution towards uh, earlier equation. So you say that you have a, a rate of convergence for P infinity, but for, uh, for P, which is uh, between one and infinity, do you have also a rate of convergence? No. Or no. You, you cannot have a, a rate of convergence? No, there are some quantit uh, there were some quantitative estimates, but it's not really a rate of convergence. Quantitative in the in the work in this recent work by uh, uh, Siam Patkripa and Spiritu. Okay, so they <coughs> did not uh, get to obtain a rate of convergence. No, okay, not really. Um, there is a rate of convergence for energy. Okay, this okay. is a consequence of our work. Okay, not for the solution. Yeah. Um, I have also an, another question about um, the constructive, uh, about the construction of dissipative solution uh, in 2D. So you say, so a, a Mikado uh, solution uh, construct for 3D uh, polar case uh, does not work in the, in the case of 2D uh, equation because the space in, is, um, I mean, uh, too small in one sense. So how uh, do you think we can uh, build the uh, dissipative solution uh, into the, I mean, uh, on which tool uh, you can, uh, we can expect to construct the dissipative know. solution? You don't have a... Uh, no, okay. I don't know. Okay. okay. Someone has uh, another question? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Yes. Uh, Elena, um, from what you said a few minutes ago, uh, it seems that um, the, the, there are some difficulties in the Lagrangian thing, but that's probably because uh, uh, the viscous term plays an important role or uh, what, what what was causes this difficulty? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Uh, uh, what, what do you mean the difficulty in the Lagrange? You stated you stated <laughs> that there is an Illyrian and the Lagrangian proof a few minutes ago, and that the Lagrangian ah. one has some difficulties. Oh, okay. So no, what I said, <clears throat> what I said was. Uh, there, this is this refers to the work by uh, Siampa, Kripa, and Spiritu. Okay, what I said was that uh, so they have a pr they have two proofs, a Lagrangian and an Eulerian. The Lagrangian is only done for initial vorticities, which are L a pth power iterable with p greater than one. Okay. They do not do the the proof for p equal one. They claim that they expect it to be true. Okay, but they think that it's going to be way too technical. I see. Yeah. Okay, that, that, that's all. <clears throat> May I offer a comment on that? Um, I, I, uh, I, I don't think it's due to the, um, I think it's due to the viscosity. There is a technical exactly. point. Uh, I, there's a technical point at p equal one when you uh, when you are doing when you're using some of the tools that they're using, and it's actually more like the failure of some harmonic analysis techniques at the borderline case p equal one. So I I, I I do believe what you're saying that you know you can make it work, but but it's going to be I guess much more complicated compared to um, to the proof for p bigger than one. But I believe it's more a technical issue than really something deeper. Yeah, well, for one, uh, you need to do the extension of the de Perlion theory yeah. <coughs> for, for people yes. one. I think that's what you're talking yes. about, isn't it? Yes, yes, exactly. So it's, it's uh, I mean, like when, in, in, in the Lagrangian coordinates, they're using some tools from harmonic analysis, like, you know, estimates yeah. from maximal functions, yeah. and they, yeah. they become much more delicate <laughs> when they are P mm -hmm. equal one. I mean, they fail, and uh, but I think it's more like a technical problem, actually, than a than, than, than really like, you know, a, a, an indication that uh, viscosity is going to complicate their argument. Okay. I mean, that's my impression from... Yeah, that. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that I, do, I just believe them by no means. Yeah, well, it's, uh, I mean, like, of course, um, you, you have to work out the details and they, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and you're much more complicated yeah. when, you, when you are at the borderline situation. 
And then there's also the issue of, of forcing, which strangely enough, it does complicate matters. Yeah, and, and that I can believe too, like when you pass it to the Lagrangian formulation is going to actually give you some, some headaches. Okay, there are some questions more. So, uh, if there is no more question, uh, maybe we can uh, find the speak. Yes, yes, or yeah. I think. I think uh, Rahul wants to make an announcement. Yes, small small announcement. We'll have a ten minute break, of course. But uh, after the second talk, uh, there will be a short concert, five minutes or so. Uh, Uriel has asked, Cornelius Rampf has very kindly agreed to give us a cello concert. So I hope all of you will stay for that and also for the talk. It, it, will, it will be just uh, five to six minutes. I mean, sure. not three hours. <laughs> OK. All right. <laughs> Okay, so thank you. So you can go stretch our legs and so on for 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so see you in 10 minutes. Elena. Yes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. It was great uh, to, to see you uh, after uh, uh, all these things. Um, I suppose uh, you are uh, okay. I mean, you're not like the president of Brazil. <laughs> you, you perhaps you know that the French president is ill as, uh, today. Yes. Yeah, I heard. I, yes. I heard that. I'm also worried about his, his wife, who's much older. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but okay, so I hope uh, everything is fine with you. Yeah, Good. with you too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so far, yes, 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 yes. Um, so uh, the um, so, so we, we we thought that it it is uh, useful to have uh, uh, not just the COVID news and the mathematical news. There is also some musical news which you'll be able to enjoy after the lecture of uh, the, the, the Lelis. Hmm? Yeah. Okay, very good. And uh, I suppose that Alexei is, uh, and some, perhaps some other people from, uh, from Rio are around. Ah, mm -hmm. here is Alexei. Ah, there he is. And who, who else? Hi, Alexei. Hola. See you. <laughs> Oi. Yeah. So perto, my shame. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, anybody else from Rio or from Sao Paulo who's logged in? Uh, Ele Elena. I don't or think so. who else? Can you tell me if anybody else from Rio or Sao Paulo is logged in? No, I don't think so. There are students. There are students. Ciro Campolini. Ah, yes. Yes. Good. 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 Mm. From yes, Brazil. Yes. yes. Oh, North São Paulo, and from Minas Gerais, another state. Right uh, now, because of COVID. 